I'm Lisa Haysha. Welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today I have a very special person. His name is Lee Aronson. He is a television producer and writer and soon possibly a director. He's directed a couple episodes of the shows he's been on. But there's something very unique about Lee is that he's my husband. So I would like to introduce you to him. Hi, Lisa. Hi, <laughs> Hi Lee. <laughs> Thanks for having me here today. You're welcome. It's good to have you. Good to be had. Of course it is. I know that about you. So this is about legacies. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wanted to interview you is because I think you have a lot to share. I think you had a very challenging life from knowing you as well as I do. And you've overcome obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. And being married to you for over 10 years well, together for over 10 years, I saw how much you've grown and changed, and I'd like to share that with our audience. Tell me a little bit about your childhood and some of the struggles you had in school and behaving and how, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, about being okay. a rebel and. I don't know, I'm, I'm one of those people, I guess I always, felt there was something wrong with me. But as far back as I can remember, I felt there was something wrong with me. And I think the reason I felt there was something wrong with me is because grown-ups kept coming up to me and saying, Lee, what the hell is wrong with you? Yeah, you know? that would be a sign. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably ADD before they had coined the term. I was the kind of kid, you know, in, in kindergarten, all the other kids are you know, at their desks, coloring inside the lines, you know, and I'm up in front of the class going, hello, my honey, hello, my baby, pay attention to me. <laughs> and so I'd end up sitting in the corner and, you know, I'd end up uh, going to the principal's office and I'd go staying home, uh, staying after school and parent-teacher conferences and, you know, child psychologists. But there's something to that because I have a niece, Daniela, who is very similar to that. She was always in the principal's office, always at the chalkboard, writing things, always getting in trouble. I think she got kicked out of a couple of schools and she really excelled also. So do you think there's something about having a high IQ or, uh, I know ADD was in there because yeah. I know you're very ADD, but do you think it's also a level of boredom? Well, Daniela excelled academically. I never excelled academically. I, I graduated high school with a 1.8 average. I, I, the only reason I graduated, because uh, I flunked gym my senior year, and the only reason they let me graduate is because they didn't want me around another year. You know. <laughs> so you were basically, get him yeah. out of here. Goodbye. Bye. Um, and I didn't get into college right away. Um, what does right away mean? I didn't get into college right out of high school. I applied to a bunch of schools and they all said no because I had very high test scores and I actually won a New York State Region Scholarship which was based on a standardized test. I always tested very well. But my grades were, you know, for crap. And so they thought, oh, classic underachiever, you know, we don't need him. So I took uh, a year and, uh, well, I took a year. I was forced out of my house because my parents said, no, you're not living here anymore. And um, I moved to New York City and I got a job. Lafayette Radio Electronics, which was the kind of like Radio Shack of the day, you know, so I was working behind the parts counter. I had a little one room apartment on 44th Street. And, uh, you know, fall turned to winter and I'm freezing to death in New York. And you know, New York when you're broke in the winter is not the most pleasant place to be. And so I decided this would probably be a good time to take my father up on his offer to send me to Israel. You know, for years he'd been saying, you should go to Israel, spend some time on a kibbutz. Yeah, dad, I'm gonna go to Israel and carry bananas. You got it. You know, cut to the winter of, you know, right. 19... <laughs> you were inspired all of a sudden. <laughs> the the winter good. of 1970, all of a sudden, yeah, it sounds good. And so, uh, yeah, I spent a few months in Israel um, working on a kibbutz, doing bananas, picking oranges, uh, rented a motor scooter and, uh, you know, tooled around, uh, tooled around the country, down through the desert. And, you know, this was between wars. We had no idea there was going to be a whole bunch of other wars. There'd just been the 67 war and that was over. And, you know, everything seemed to be relatively cool at the time. So. But how did that work for you? Did you get inspired <coughs> there? W were you more disciplined? Did you rebel? What did um, you I smoked a lot of hash. 
Um, Did that mellow you out? Uh, uh, I, no, I was always looking for something. You know, I, I always thought wherever I was, it was all happening someplace else. You know, um, and that's a feeling that I didn't get over until relatively late in life. So, you know, after some months in Israel, then I wanted to go to Europe because I thought it was all happening in Amsterdam, you know. So I went to Amsterdam and hung out there for a little while and with some house crackers, you know, or people who squat and condemn buildings, you know, and smoked dope there. And, and then we went to Copenhagen and uh, um, smoked dope there and went to, uh, uh, took a tour of the Carlsberg Beer Brewery and the Tuberg Beer Brewery. And I don't drink beer, but they were giving out free beer, so I drank and, you know, and smoked. And, and at the end of one of these tours, somebody said, let's go to a tattoo parlor. And that seemed like a really good idea, so. Of course it yeah. did. <laughs> well, here's the thing, you see. So I'm, I'm, I'm like 18 at the time, yes. and the Vietnam War is going on, and I don't want to get, you know, I, I don't want to go to Vietnam. I don't, I'm going to last about 30 seconds in the Army mm -hmm. with my attitude. And so I did my due diligence and I read all the draft regulations, you know, what could disqualify you. And I found out this really interesting little uh, sub rule, which was the army would not take you if you had a quote, obscene tattoo, okay? So here's my brilliant plan. I'm gonna get fuck the army tattooed on my saluting hand, you know? That's okay. brilliant. <laughs> So, so we're in Copenhagen, we go down to the waterfront where all the tattoo parlors are, and uh, you know, I tell them I want fuck the army tattooed on my saluting hand. And apparently the law in Denmark is you cannot be tattooed above the wrist bones. So I'm not gonna walk out of there without a tattoo. So I got this, which is a peace sign, and it used to be my name over it, L-E-E. -E. Um, well, that's a very different from your original idea. Yeah. Of peace. Well, it's still anti-war, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, and um, this is the exact size of a Danish kroner coin, mm -hmm. or was at the time. You know, he he put it on my arm and he drew the outline, and you know, and then he did the rest freehand, which really freaked me out. You know, because when somebody is drawing on you indelibly forever, mm -hmm. you kind of want them to have a guide, not just be winging it, but. Um, so I've had that ever since, and um, from Copenhagen, uh, went to Germany, and um, then I went home, and I had applied while I was in Israel to the University of Pittsburgh for a uh, probationary acceptance. So I had to go to a, um, I had to go to a um, little branch campus at the University of Pittsburgh in Titusville, Pennsylvania, a tiny little town in western Pennsylvania. I had a great summer, you know. I had to take two courses and I had to get B's or better, I think, to get full admittance to the University of Pittsburgh system. And, um, you know, partied every night, um, got high a lot. And in the middle of that summer, the draft lottery occurred. And I don't know, you may not know what the draft lottery was, but in those days, they would take birthdays, you know, every date, January 1st through December 31st, put them all in a bowl, and they'd pick dates in order, and the order that you were picked was the order that you got drafted. So if you were picked, you know, 250th, chances are you weren't gonna get drafted. My number was three. Ah, of course it was. Of course it was. <laughs> So we're listening to this on the, you know, we're watching this on TV yeah. in, in the dorm, and, uh, you know, my number comes up three. I'm not happy about this. And so somehow somebody got a plastic, big plastic American flag from someplace, and we poured lighter fluid on it, and we set it on fire out in front of the dorm. And then we hung the charred remains in front of the dormitory. Now you gotta understand, this dorm building was just in the middle of this this residential neighborhood in this tiny midwestern you know mid western Pennsylvania town, and there's this charred American flag hanging up there. Okay, this was the biggest scandal that had hit Titusville, Pennsylvania, in years. There was an investigation. There was you know it was all oh, very 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 dire, 
And the upshot of it was um, I was invited not to return to the University of Titusville, uh, University of Pittsburgh at Titusville. So I transferred to a, in the fall, since my grades were good enough um, to matriculate, I went to another little branch campus uh, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was a slightly bigger town. Uh, Why did you even want to go to college? Fear. Um, I grew up, my parents, my father was an attorney, um, you know, upper middle class Jewish upbringing. Where I grew up, everybody went to college. <laughs> but where you grew up, everyone also probably did well in school or at least tried to. Well, there were some screw ups like me, the kids I hung out with in, college, in high school. I hung out with a group of kids in high school. We called ourselves freaks. You know, there were freaks and there were straights. And I thought all the freaks were as big screw-ups as I was, and it really wasn't true. Yeah, they were smoking dope, but they were also going home mm -hmm. and doing their homework. So, um, yeah, the, the, the answer to the question, why did I want to go to college, was simply because that's what you did. Okay. You know, uh, I've been... That's what you saw your father do. Well, that's my father instilled in me yes. that if I didn't go to college, you know, my life was going to be a horrific nightmare of, you know, failure and deprivation. You know, my father grew up during the Depression. Mm -hmm. And so he was very big on, you know, do the work and, you know, uh, keep all your options open. Yeah, and even if you don't use it, it's good to have in your back right, pocket. Right, right. So I had no idea what I wanted to do, uh, but I certainly felt like I needed, you know, I needed to get into college and, you know, get a degree. And, uh, you know, I thought, hey, maybe I can go to law school or something. So in Johnstown was uh, this little campus up in, the, up in the mountains in the Alleghenies. You know, it's like kind of really isolated. And it was just like, um, you know, 600 students or something, much dorms, you know, and beautiful, but really isolated to the extent that on weekends, you know, everybody on campus was on the same drug. You know, it's just like it was, it was acid weekend, it was mescaline weekend. It was, uh, you know, so there was a lot of that and I got, uh, got into a fair amount of trouble um, for various things. I put, on a, I put on a play there that ended up wrecking the space that it was in and um, I don't know, it, it was just, it was a weird year. And I guess I must have done all right academically because I applied to transfer to the University of Colorado from there. And the University of Colorado I applied to because I read the underground guide to the, comic, the college of your choice. And what it said was uh, the University of Colorado was the party capital of the West. So I thought, They beat hey, San Diego out? That's for me. <laughs> Okay. Uh, maybe it was Midwest, okay. I don't know. Okay. No, but it was, it was highly rated for sex and drugs. And so I thought, okay, that's for me. And uh, <laughs> there you have it. There I have it. I ended up at the University of Colorado. I majored in political science. I want to backtrack a okay. little, then we could continue on. All right. Yeah, I've been talking a long time yeah. with no interruption. Yeah, um, because that, you have uh, good stories, though. So otherwise, I would have interrupted you. You can edit, you know. Yeah, no, I don't think I want to edit. I'll keep it. They're interesting stories because of all those experiences, you still succeeded. And I want to give people who are like you, one thing, hope, and two, that they can look into the, something. And three, if they don't, if they aren't, if they don't have a high IQ or aren't talented or really gifted in one area, don't do what you did. <laughs> 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 don't so do I, what I did anyway, because it really, it, my, the fact that I'm not you know, dead in a gutter someplace, I attribute as much to luck as anything else. You know, I know a and lot times of... And times were different back then, too. That's true, too. Now but, you don't know what's in drugs before it was more pure. Um, but I, you know, I know a lot of people smarter than me who ended up dead. Yeah. Uh, so that, you know, yes, kids, stay off drugs. Um, <laughs> um, but I want to go back a little bit, then we're going to go back into how you became so successful in comedy and I want to discuss some of the people you met and the personalities of comics. All right. But before I do that, I, as you know, am a big traveler and I love travel and I think travel's 
so important to anyone if you want to grow as a human being or if you want to, you know, really develop yourself, you know, become an onion, have all these layers to you. If you just keep reading books and saying, oh, that's how it is and you don't ever go anywhere, I think you're missing out a lot on life. But so you traveled a lot when you yeah. kind of, well, you, you I, got around I, Amsterdam. Because Germany. I kept get throwing out of, I kept getting thrown out of places. But <laughs> is, I want to know still, how did that affect you, especially Israel? How did all those experiences? I have to be honest with you, Lisa. I was not, I was not open to any of the benefits that you're talking about. You know, I was driven by fear as a kid. Uh, I was driven by, as I said, the feeling that Wherever I was, the party was someplace else. You know, I was but what did you learn when you were in Germany or London or Israel? Did you, did you leave the country with a takeaway saying, God, I didn't know that, or these people are this way and I thought they were that way? Any ahas, any... You know, uh, appreciation for the world. I learned how to buy hashish in Hebrew. Um, okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> this has some value if you're into hashish. I, I met, uh, w one thing I do remember uh, that did make an impression on me, there were, there were a lot of Holocaust survivors. I met a lot of people with tattoos on their arms, mm. you know, and... Did you go to the Dachau Museum? Oh, or? no. Okay. I, di I didn't do any of the sightseeing stuff, okay. but I mean, they were just everywhere. Um, yes. The, uh, but I left there with such a strong feeling of what did we do? Who are we as human beings? And I had to come, go home and research it, and it really... I felt a lot closer to Jews and I felt connected to Germans of feeling like, what are they doing and how can I not be that way or, you know, just everything. It just stirred up all these emotions. I walked in going, oh, it's kind of like a museum because I was kind of naive and I left bawling and crying and just. I was not that emotionally open. Um, and what I knew about history, mm -hmm. you know, was basically reinforced by my experiences, uh, you know, because I had, I, I had been given books yes. on the Holocaust and, and the history of the Jews and everything by my father. And so that made it all, you know, more real to me. Went to Jerusalem, okay. went to the Wailing Wall. Okay, you know, yeah, I didn't it, have those experiences. And it was more, it was more of a uh, observational thing for me than a, um, than an emotional experience. You know, I filed it all away. And uh, when I went to Germany, a very telling experience to me was I had just gotten this tattoo and I'm sitting in a beer hall in, might have been Munich, might have been Frankfurt, and a uh, German guy sitting next to me says, uh, why did you get that? And I said, why not? And he said, you can't answer a question with a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can now understand a little bit about the German mindset. I took a, um, a charter flight home from Germany, an airline called uh, Atlantis Airways, okay, and I was using somebody else's charter ticket. So we met in Frankfurt at the airport, and he checked in and, you know, then gave me his boarding pass. So I was on the plane under, you know, false pretenses. And it's a, you know, whatever it is, nine hour trip to New York. And towards the end of the trip, I really had to go to the bathroom and there'd been a line to the restroom, you know, for an hour. And suddenly I realized there's no line there. So I get up and I head for the bathroom and uh, the stewardess stops and he says, the, the captain has turned on the, no, uh, the seat belts on, you must switch on to your seat. I said, yeah, I just gotta, and I'll be right back. No, the seat belt sign is on, you must return to the seat. You don't understand. I really have to. No, the captain has turned the seatbelt on. <laughs> so I, I just push past her and I go into the bathroom. She comes and she's. <laughs> you must return to your seats. The seatbelt sign is on. So I finish doing what I need to do and I go back to my seat and uh, the stewardess comes over. And says, can I see your passport, please? Okay, a German telling a Jew, can I see your papers, basically, is enough to send chills down your spine. And mm -hmm. I can't show it to her because it's not the name on my ticket. So I say, no, I'm not going to. I mean, what's she going to do at that point? <laughs> Throw me off the plane? We're approaching New York. You know? Or arrest you when you land, yeah. Well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, the airlines weren't as militarized in those okay. days as they are now. Uh, so she says to me, the so next time you fly to Germany, you will fly TWA, 
You will fly Lufthansa. You will not fly Atlantis. <laughs> that's the last time I've been back to Germany. Mm. Okay, that's too bad because it's such a great place. I'm it's sure it is. I love Germany and I love so many of the Germans. Moving I mean, not, yeah, I've got nothing against individual Germans, but as a culture, um, you know, some comic at the time the Berlin Wall came down and there yeah. was, you know, reunif reunification. Uh, some comic said something like, you know, uh, uh, I, w I wasn't that big a fan of their old work, so I'm, n I'm not really looking forward to the reunion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Germany. So you didn't really have some of the intense life-altering experiences through travel at that mm, age. No. But you did later with me. Yes. Maybe. Yes. Because but I was much older. Yes. Yes. And sober. Yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been together. Yeah. All those well. years. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about that, about just travel in general in Cambodia, Cuba? I don't know. I'd never done the kind of traveling that you do, you know, which is, um, you know, you just like to go and immerse yourself. And um, I guess one of the first trips we took was to Cambodia. And we got off the plane and we checked in the hotel. And immediately you wanted to go meet this guy at this garbage dump, you know, and it's this huge acres and acres of smoking, smelly, horrible, you know, huge trash for the, uh, you know, seemed like for the children entire fun. city. Yeah. Um, and there were groups of kids, little kids, picking through the trash, looking for, you know, recyclable, I, I guess they were looking for Yeah, they got metals. a quarter for... X amount of metals or yeah. what they found. Yeah. And um, that, w you know, that was their livelihood. And that just horrified me. You know, the fact that they're, I mean, I know intellectually. Yes, but it's the first time you were seeing it. It's the first time I've been confronted yes. with it, you know, and, and, you know, we went, you were, you were uh, hooking up with Scott. Scott Neeson, Scott Neeson, the founder down there. of the Cambodia Children's Fund. Right, and yes. he took us around to, you know, uh, you know where some of these kids lived, and uh, then we went to where he was sheltering a number of them, and uh, we, you know they were such sweet kids. You know, I remember, and it, it really did yeah. move me. But and when I saw you there, I could see that you were influenced by that. What I want to do here is inspire others to go and do something that makes you uncomfortable to get outside the box that you Oh my think, god. Oh. Well, I if And that's why I forced going you Going to, to it. Israel in the first place was an incredibly uncomfortable yes. thing. The only re and I did it because it was more uncomfortable to stay where I was. Yes, that's what I want. I want to go deeper instead of just it, It's not uh, I I've, I've really never been one to um, choose the harder path but I've been willing to walk down mm -hmm. the harder path if that's the one yes. that opens for me. Um, and that's, that's really where my whole life uh, has, that's really what my whole life has resulted from, is showing up and uh, you know, being willing to do what's in front of me to do. You know, my career in writing is a perfect example. When I came out here, I mean, to jump ahead from University of Colorado, mm -hmm. okay, three years, political science major, ba ba ba, and I meet a girl one summer who's from uh, Nebraska, and she's going to the University of Nebraska, and uh, she moved in with me for my senior year in Boulder. She took a year off from school, and I was pre-law, and I was taking my LSATs, and in the middle of my LSATs, I'm thinking to myself, do I really want to go to school for three more years, or do I want to move to Lincoln, Nebraska with my girlfriend? I moved to Lincoln, Nebraska with Instead my girlfriend. Instead of law school. I did. <laughs> okay. She and, must have been some girl. Uh, no, nah, really, it was a one-night stand that lasted like three and a half years. Okay. It was not, not a very meaningful relationship, but the fact of the matter was, I didn't really want to go to law school. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to go to school. and. Um, so I moved to Lincoln and I opened up a, a little business. I opened up a, it was a used record and comic book store. And opened it up and it was close to the university campus and, you know, actually supported myself with it for, you know, however long I was there, a couple of years. 
but I had no long-term plan. I certainly knew, you know, that wasn't where you want to end up. Where I wanted to end up, but you know, it was a nice little interlude. But then she graduated, and we broke up, and I am now in Lincoln, Nebraska, with no girlfriend. So uh, I sold the business to a kid who worked for me, who is still running it there. That's believe incredible. it or not, it's still yes. open. And uh, I went back to New York um, for a little bit, and I did something which I had always dreamed about doing, which was stand-up comedy. You know, that had like always been my fantasy. And um, one night at uh, open mic night at the Improv in New York, um, I actually got up and did some stuff, and I actually got a few laughs. You know, and that, that was like that was like the okay, I'm hooked. You know, for somebody who's like an intention yeah. junkie and, you know, trying to fill up a, a hole, you know, that laughter is like the best drug in the world. And, um, you know, the people I was meeting there was like Andy Kaufman was there. He was unknown at the time. And Larry David was mm. a stand-up there. And, um, you was know. Was Jay Leno also? Jay Leno I didn't meet until I came to L.A. Okay, let me ask you this. The people that you met, all these great comics that you met when they were just starting out, uh, from firsthand experience, I know some very funny, successful people who suffer a little from depression. And most writers I know are not happy. Writers and comics, especially mm -hmm. if they're, they write Comics funny. are, no, comedy comes from pain. Yes. And humiliation and anger. And with the exception of Jay Leno, I don't think I've ever met a comic who was not angry and unhappy and in vain. Okay, so talk to me a little bit about that. Robin Williams just passed, you know, suicide, it seems. So can you share a little bit about that? I know you met him once. Well, I'm more than once. When I, you know, after I started in New York, I went back to Nebraska because it was too damn cold in New York and I was broke. And then I came to L.A. for the first time with a friend of mine who was coming out here for like two weeks uh, for some convention, audio engineers convention. He was the guy who did all my 8-track tape player hookups in my store because we dealt in tapes and records and comic books. And at the end of two weeks, he went back to Nebraska and I stayed out here because I had discovered the comedy store. And they had open mic nights too. And so, you know, I started just plugging away at the comedy store. Now, in those days, and this was 1977, uh, there were really only two comedy clubs, the comedy store and the improv, and there was no real way to make a living. Uh, there was no road mm -hmm. or anything. And, but there was a hierarchy of comics and, and the big shots at the comedy store who were still completely unknown outside the comedy store were David Letterman and Jay Leno, Robin Williams and Richard Lewis and uh, Michael Keaton was doing stand-up in those days. I mean, you know, an incredible number of very, very funny people. You just listed a bunch of my favorites, of yeah. course, yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> it's going to be a long time before there's any room for right. me at the top of the hierarchy. But I knew Robin um, casually, you know, just to say hi to, hang out. Um, and once I started writing, being paid to write, which is a story I will tell you how that came about, uh, I basically stopped hanging out at the store, and this was 1978, and um, all of a sudden Mork and Mindy hit. I mean, you know, just exploded. And Robin Williams goes from being unknown to being, you know, on every magazine yeah, superstar, cover. Yeah, superstar, right. And, uh, and one night, around that time, I found myself at the Ginger Man uh, in Beverly Hills. It's a restaurant that was owned by Carol O'Connor. Mm -hmm. And I, I have no recollection of why I was there, but it was relatively late. I, mean, I was probably there trying to pick up women. And Robin Williams is there sitting at the bar just drinking alone, you know? And so, you know, he, it wasn't, he hadn't reached the level of fame where you know, he was mobbed or everybody recognized him yet. He, he was a star of a hit TV show. And um, 
you know, nationally he was getting a lot of publicity, but, you know, in town he was another, you know, mm -hmm. successful actor. And so I said hi to him, you know, and I said, congratulations, man, you know, this show is blowing up. It was fantastic. And he was not happy at all. He said to me, man, it's insane, man. I don't know how I'm going to handle it. And he just looked miserable. And it was at that moment that I gave up wanting to be famous. Mm. You know, and that's, that's the last time I ever ran into him. But, um, you know, over... So, you, so you really believed him? Because sometimes I hear actors saying that, of, oh, I hate this, I hate oh, no. this, they go forward. I'm like, you don't hate it. You're, they're just acting humble or acting... No, no. But you I, felt it Well, from... because any... If, what you know about comics is yeah. comics have a hole they're trying to fill. Um, but you, and they're filling, and they, they need to fill it with approval and with laughter. And, and Robin had that more than anybody. So you really felt that. so eager to yeah. please. You know, he, he wasn't. He was never looking to be famous. He was looking to be loved. And um, you know, but you could tell. It was just very apparent to me that oh wait, you know, this thing that I thought was so great to have, not necessarily so great. And I, I make the joke that. You know, I wanted to be famous up till the point that I started meeting famous people. And that moment with Robin Williams was like the first and the biggest. But, you know, throughout my career, I've never seen anything to indicate that um, fame, was healthy. fame and success <laughs> makes anybody happy. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are happy before, you know, can be happy afterwards. But Jane Leno is the only one that I, uh, the only comic that I ever met. Well, now through, who seemed at all happy. Well, um, through especially the past 10, 15 years, you have become more and more famous. Even though people can't recognize uh, you on the street, your name is famous or your shows that you've produced mm -hmm. are famous. Yeah, that's not, it's not the same thing. Yeah, but, it, not, but did it affect you still is what I want to know. Did, did that shift something in you? Did you feel overwhelmed? Did you feel pressure? Did you feel, ah, I made it because I get to be famous and nobody will even know me. No, I can, well, still here's, go here's the, here's the thing. You see, my, my career had two phases. When I first came out here, um, I went from doing stand-up to writing for television, a very quick transition. Um, I, it happened really by chance. Uh, a television writer saw me perform. Um, he was a friend of our family. And he said, you're funny. Have you ever considered writing? And he was a writer for The Love Boat. And I said, no, I hate writing. And he told me how much they were paying writers on The Love Boat. And I said, you know, on the other hand. Writing's my favorite thing to do. Okay, I hate I it. I love to okay. write. <laughs> but I needed to eat. And so, you know, he sent me some scripts, and I pitched some stories, and I wrote some spec scenes, and, uh, you know, bottom line, yada, 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 I get an assignment on Love Boat, and it turns out I can do this. I can write television. Maybe it's because, you know, I spent so much of my childhood sitting in front of a television screen, I absorbed through osmosis the rhythms, mm -hmm. you know, and I have, had a good ear for dialogue. And writing turned out to be the one thing I could do that people would pay me to do that didn't involve anal sex, you know, so I went for it. And I made a lot of money in a very short period of time, and I'm only 25, 26 years old. And I could not handle it. Um, the little voice in my head was saying, you're really supposed to be in law school, this is a mistake, you know, you never studied writing, you know, you're not really a writer, all these things, um, all these voices, and, um, you know, that's when I discovered drugs. I got very into cocaine. I quit my job. Uh, don't ask me why. Uh, it was an insane thing to do, but I quit the job and I just partied for three years until the money ran out. And by so the time- So you had three years of money? Yeah. From the, okay. And you quit because you didn't want the discipline anymore to have to show up every No, day. it was an ego thing. It was like they'd hired another writer, you know, a real writer with a track record who had, you know, had a career. And they, I found out they were paying him more than me. And I said, oh, how dare they? Don't they know who I am? You know, called my agent, asked them to release me from my contract. And, well, they did release me from my contract? Okay. <laughs> ah, okay. 
you know, and it took me, you know, three years to really run through everything, all the residuals, because the residuals kept coming yeah. in for a while. And then it took me another five years after I got sober to restart my career, uh, because I'd really burned a lot of bridges. And I never really thought it would happen. You know, I, I really had resigned myself to, okay, I'm going to work whatever jobs I can get and, you know, just try and support myself. That's really all I, that was my big ambition when I got sober. But it turns, you know, as life does, it turns in mysterious ways. And um, I was actually working one of the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, which involved making amends. I wrote amends to a, uh, a producer who I had basically harmed with a very late script back when I was, you know, and I got a call from him. He was, uh, just started working on the syndicated version of Charles in Charge. He invited me to come in and pitch stories. So I did. And at the end of that meeting, he took me aside and, and told me he was 23 years sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm. And he gave me an assignment, and that turned into a bunch more assignments, and, you know, it turned into a, a I had a career again. And this time, you know, I was willing to accept it. I was willing to accept the success. Um, I didn't have that drive to self-destruct and throw it away. And so... I guess the best thing that ever happened to me, you know, was crashing and burning early on when I was young. Because I've seen a lot of people, you know, who don't, and they crash and burn when there's no time to recover. They're too old. Yeah, I'd love to have two interviews with you because this is too short. You have so much to say and to share. But we have to wrap this up in a couple of minutes, and I want to get a couple of questions in. Well, is there a commercial break coming or something? Uh, no, but <laughs> we've run out of tape. Uh. <laughs> this is all we've got. Um, however, who is Lee Aronson? Because there's the Lee Aronson I know, the Lee Aronson your co-workers oh, know, Lord. and yeah, of course. And then there is the true Lee Aronson. How would you describe you? I, that, you know what, uh, that's a, a really tough one for me. I don't see myself really well. Mm. Um, you know, and your, par your, your imposter paradigm, mm -hmm. I think, applies a lot to me. I've got a lot of different personalities, some of which are authentic, some of which are, you know, imposters and defense mechanisms and all that. Uh, I see myself as, I see myself as less talented than other people, you know, sometimes uh, assume or ascribe to me. I consider myself a decent craftsman. I'm pretty good at what I do, but I don't think what I do is that great. So uh, you I'm an co created Two and a Half Men, yeah. and you were executive producer of Big Bang Theory. Right. And you worked on Roseanne, yeah. and Sybil, and right. Murphy Brown. I didn't work Love on Boat. Roseanne. Sybil, Murphy oh, Brown, okay. Love Boat, Charles in Charge, Who's the Boss, okay. Grace Under Fire. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've worked on a lot of shows because I. I I am good at what I do, yeah. but what I do is dependent on, very dependent on what other people do. Okay. I'm, I'm really good at optimizing okay. what other people do. I can take a script. I can't guarantee to make it good. I can guarantee it to make it better. Okay. You've proven that with me working together on belly dance. Yeah. So one last question. What do you want your legacy to be? <sighs> my kids. Um, I want my kids to not have the demons that I have. I want my kids to be comfortable in their skin. Um, I don't want my kids to be as driven by fear and shame as I've been in my life. If I can leave that behind, uh, that's far more important than my name on a bunch of television shows. Oh, that's beautiful. I would love to do a whole interview with you about shame and guilt. All right. By the way, I think you have so much to say on that subject, <laughs> if you're willing to do it. Yeah. Midnight uh, on Thursday or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Lee. I'm Lisa Hayshek here with... Lee Aronson, coming soon to the Blazing Borders website, the epic legacy interview of me by her. Be there. Or be square. Is that me trying to be funny? <laughs> <laughs>
Oy vey. I won't try to soul blaze you. I'm trying to do comedy, okay? You got it. But watch the interview.